justice for all. First and foremost, um, in our report, this in my report this evening is is a public acknowledgement of the um, interventions that have occurred in Fort Township Elementary School uh, immediately following our crisis that occurred um, over the uh, last weekend. What what happened there was uh, was essentially very tragic in that. Uh, um, Things within the building were perfect, and uh, sadly, sadly enough, uh, the weather circumstances caused something to happen that caught all of us by surprise. Um, in hindsight, I learned that um, you can have a, a something known as a dry extinguishing system, and that can uh, uh, acquire condensation, and that sadly can cause problems for us. Um, I've asked Mr. Case if he would be able to share with the board some photographs and his own personal um, experiences with dealing with that tragedy. Uh, I will say that thanks to people like him, our students really only missed one day of instruction uh, considering the damage that was done, that is a tremendous success and a great thing for our children. And it's uh, because of, of uh, employees like Mr. Case and our maintenance team, our staff members were fabulous coming in and helping us out. They pitched in and did things that I know were uh, difficult and uncomfortable and very dirty. But um, the PTA, I believe, served food to these people. It was a, a miraculous recovery from a tragic set of circumstances. Mr. Case, would you like to share your pictures, please? Right. What I'm going to show you is where we are today at Fort Stone Elementary School. And just so you understand, some of these areas that I'm going to show you right now are areas where things have already been put back because they were necessary for us to do those immediately as long as, as soon as we found out they were dry enough to be put back so we could still have school there. Because this lower area, like the faculty lounge, the kitchen, the cafeteria, is something we have to use every day. We weren't able to move those students. So those areas we concentrated on first to get everything dry before we put ceilings back. So the picture that you see there right now is the, is the faculty lounge. And this area from here over this way, all that ceiling was down and wet. So um, with the help of also Surf Pro, who we had in there, they were a professional uh, company that takes care of, of water damage, fires, and things like that to get these areas dry. So that area was totally dried out. They use a, a probe that they check all the um, ceiling or floor joists and things like that, walls to make sure the moisture levels were low enough so that we could put things back. So the faculty lounge was, was the ceiling was re, re, replaced. I think that's just, uh, important for everybody to know is that uh, we worked very closely with them in the remediation of all of this and uh, we did measure uh, for moisture in areas that remained and areas that were recovered. Um, what other technical, uh, we were looking for other aspects of, of this too as well, right Tim? Some of the equipment they use are actually just large area blowers. I think we had like 60 of those in the building. Um, large area dehumidifiers that would take moisture out of the air. Uh, air movers, um, air scrubbers, and another piece of equipment called the low grain refrigerant dehumidifiers. So there was like three or four different types of equipment that were put in that building to take moisture out of areas that got wet. And not only that was the biggest job, as you'll see as I go through these slides, everything that got wet was removed as soon as possible. There's things that I've learned in this um, I wasn't aware of. Even though we had wet books and dry books over here, we had to remove the wet books immediately, otherwise they would then, uh, you know, that disturbance in those wet, moist books would then be transferred to books that were dry. So that's why things happen 
as quickly as possible. Everything in that building that was wet was removed as fast as we possibly could. We took four of the largest dumpsters that they you see sitting around, probably as you drive through the township and stuff, four large dumpsters out of that building. Okay, so this is a slide in the family lounge, which wasn't replaced yet, some code base that come off. The, the BCT, the floor covering down there, we think that we were able to suck up the water fast enough down there, and that floor tile was laid on concrete. They were hoping that the floor tile is going to be okay. This next picture is actually in a, a little storage room uh, as you come in off of the cafeteria loading area, and that's a plaster ceiling. So that area, as of today, was still left open. There were no air dryers in there. It was just left open for it to completely dry out. That's our main concern. The next picture is actually a, a hard plaster ceiling in the ladies' room, and you can see how some of the, plate, the paint has blistered. So there's a possibility that we still may have to take that plaster ceiling down or we may have to just repaint it. They are continually checking the moisture levels in, in that hard ceiling there. I'm sorry, this, this one is the actual storage closet. That other one was the drop ceiling was missing was actually the men's room in that lower level. So you have to understand, right above that was Mrs. Almond's room that was basically destroyed. So some of this water did come through. What you have at Forks, that building was built in 1935. So it's actually tongue and groove boards on a 45 with uh, probably one inch, uh, one inch maple hardwood floors and then glue on and then tile or carpet on top of that. Um, this is actually in the hallway. Outside of the cafeteria, there are still some tiles out where water had come down. This is actually Mitch's, Mitch Schwartz's, our head custodian, his um, storage room. And in all those cabinets there is where all the school supplies were kept. So anything that got wet in that room was removed. And then all the school supplies that were in those cabinets, even though they didn't get wet, were removed and made sure that they were dry and the cabinets were dry enough and moisture levels were checked before he could put things back. And he's basically in the process now of putting back. Above that drop ceiling there, if any of you have some older homes, you may have the one foot by one foot um, tongue and groove tiles that were stapled up, and that's what was in that room. So you can notice that room above that drop ceiling, all that was already removed. And most of these areas, the air um, blowers ran for the entire week as soon as that was removed to get up the air up in there. This is the kitchen area, and if you can notice some of the tiles that are whiter than the others, those were tiles that came down. So that area was dried out and the tiles were replaced and um, uh, the kitchen personnel were in that, that first day that we were back to totally clean all the kitchen area. And I also will say that they helped out by um, serving some pizza and stuff to the employees that were there that day. They were very helpful the ladies that were there. It was great. I mean, and they cleaned their entire area up. This is an area right outside the serving area. And you can see the serving area a little bit there to the right where it's yellow. That is some of the sheet. The, the upper section here that's still in place is actually plaster, but that lower section probably was remodeled and they closed something up so they actually had sheetrock there. So that sheetrock was wet and damaged and it was cut out and removed. And then on the other side of that is the back of the sheetrock and tile. Some of that got wet, so they dried it out and actually then paint sealed it with a paint. This was all done by, by Surfro. This is a cafeteria, and if you can see from this beam back this way, all that tile is all new in there. Because that was the two rooms above that that were basically destroyed. And you can notice on the floor the code base is still off. Now, we, like I said before, we are hoping that because the vinyl, the VCT was on concrete, it should be okay. It hasn't curled up yet, but we are keeping an eye on it. This is just showing you some of the code base that's still removed. This is something that, that Servpro did at the top of the steps as you go to the second floor in both areas. They immediately plastic things off and it has a zipper there you can walk through. So when the, once the kids came back, they were isolated from anything up there in that upstairs area. They were separated from that, and that was done on both sides. 
This is a classroom where the pipe wasn't leaking above it. However, there was water in the hallways and then water seeped into some of these classrooms where the carpet in that room was wet in the area where you see the plywood removed. So all the quarter inch underlayment was, well, half the room, the underlayment was removed there. And you could see the old maple flooring and the, where the glue was uh, for the quarter inch lawn. So in there, all the carpet was taken out. So there's no way to save some of it and not save the other half. Um, and all the wet um, underlayment and then moisture samples were taken from the, the maple flooring there to make sure that we were good. And then of course the code base was all actually removed from those rooms also. This is uh, the next room here is one of the rooms that had a lot of damage done. And this is looking up into the attic. Um, basically the up in the attic was blown in loose wool insulation about 16 inches. That laid on top of the old original half inch homo soap that had battens over the seams and was painted yellow um, from years ago. So after, if you've seen some of the pictures that the fire company had posted, you'll notice that everything's down on top of the student's desk. Basically everything was 16 inches of loose wool, uh, half inch homo soap, that came down and it completely collapsed the drop ceiling, the light fixtures, and everything on top of the desk in four classrooms. So you can see everything was removed there um, in the ceiling. Actually, in some of the rooms, it was it, in three of the rooms, it was bad enough that um, the casework was actually removed because the quarter inch underlayment went in under the, the casework, which is the bookshelves and the wall here. So they were all removed and uh, everything was dried out in there. The cubbies were removed from those classrooms because the water got in under the cubbies. Um, also in the classrooms that had the severe damage, the lower foot of sheetrock was, it absorbed that moisture and it sucked it up into the wall. So that was all cut out and removed. This is another classroom where the water just got under the door and there were some cubbies that actually had to be removed. This is a, a, a storage room where the underlayment didn't get wet, but the floor tiles were wet enough that they all curled up. So we removed the floor tiles, they took a moisture check on the, on the underlayment and that was good, so we didn't take it out of there. Again, this is a room where some of the cubbies were removed, and you can notice on that one wall, like 16 inches up where it got wet was removed, and right under the computer controls there, there was some sheetrock that was removed. So basically what I'm showing you is that everything in this school that got wet was taken out of the building as fast as we possibly could. Again, another classroom where there was portions of the subfloor out, but all every classroom, the, the, the carpet was removed. Again, some more areas where cubbies were taken out. And this is a room that had a lot of damage. And actually, you can see there against the wall was one of the one of the blowers, the air movers. Once they took that lower portion of the wall out, they had those like lined up. And it was just flowing tremendous amounts of air into that wall to get it dry enough to the point where the moisture test would then come back okay. And they were they were running day and night. This is another room where the ceiling came down. Another picture of the same. Now this room here, the ceiling, some of the ceiling wasn't wet here, but they, we basically took it out now. All the light pictures were removed and they're, they're actually in the fourth garage because we're planning to put those back up. This is a room where you can see where they took more of the base off. Um, in the hallway. The hallway was all uh, VCT, all the VCT was removed, and the subfloor, and all the hallways upstairs. I think that's my final picture. And the only thing I can, I can say that I wanted to add to that, at this point, like I said, the demo stage is complete. Um, today, we had uh, Element Environment there. They're doing air quality sampling in that whole area and downstairs. Um, when the project's done, we'll do that again to make sure we're okay. If something would come back um, 
negative right now, then we're going to have to look in why, why it came back negative. We may have to remove some other areas. So hopefully not. Um, both Josh Brock, Bryce from Dewey and myself are meeting with um, Kissler O'Brien tomorrow to see what needed improvements we have to make to the dry system in the attic so that we don't have areas where moisture could become trapped and have the same situation happen again. Um, and Josh Bryce and myself have already met with two different contractors and we've got a price so far um, from the one contractor for the new carpet in all the classrooms, the code base, and the vinyl pile in the hallways. Um, the other contractor is working on a price for um, replacing all the sheetrock, plaster, painting, drop ceilings, and all that. Um, I'd like to just thank um, Mr. Warren and his staff because um, I can tell you that the day that I was up there with the fire company <coughs> happened, I, I was um, really shaken. Um, and I felt bad for all those teachers that were in those classrooms because I know myself that that's, that's their livelihood. And there were things in those classrooms that they had from the first day they taught. And um, to see the, the frame of mind that all those teachers came in that day to help us clean out was unbelievable. There was not one negative thing said. Everything was all positive. They all worked together. I'm sure that there were some tears sh shed by some people that lost things that they had for a long time. But amazing job by Mr. Warren and the teaching staff um, up there that day. I also like to thank the um, Forks Fire Company um, for their quick response. We're, we're thinking the water may have ran for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, once they got there and they found out what it was, and they got it valved off. They immediately started bringing a number of tarps and trying to cover the materials on the lower floors to save them from getting room. So, I mean, had it been for them, some of the materials on the lower floor that you see that was saved uh, was because of their efforts, and they did a tremendous job also. Um, Steve Davis from Surfco, I'm learning an awful lot. I'm an old man, but I tell you what, you can always learn new things. And Surfco um, done a tremendous job. I think today they still have some equipment in two classrooms. But they're basically off site right now. But without their help, it wouldn't have been possible. Of course, Josh Bryce from Dewey um, got a phone call from Josh like Monday morning, and Josh is like, Why didn't you call me yet? Why haven't you called me? You need help. I'm coming right down. So, again, um, Josh from Dewey, thanks so much for his help. Mitch Porch and his custodial staff um, were there a lot of hours last week. Um, and last but not least, my guys, I know the day that it happened when I called home to my wife, I was like, Sue, you need to call every one of my guys like right now. And I can tell you that um, every one of them responded and they were all like, we knew it was bad because your wife said that you were a wretch. So thank, thanks to all of them for showing up and uh, hopefully we can get everything back together and Forks will be as good and as great as it's always been. And Thanks for taking time out to hear what happened at Forks, and uh, hopefully it never happens again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Great job. And one other thing I'd like to thank, I'm not that technology advanced, so I'd like to thank Ann for helping me out. <laughs> I was going to take the credit, but I really didn't like that. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, President Johnson. Thank you. Uh, before we move any further, we're going to make uh, we're going to add to the agenda number nine under personnel. We're going to add letter M, motion to authorize superintendent to create additional position to assist with student discipline at the high school. We're going to get a number four reports. Ms. Price, how are you trying?
um, at the, the students and the parents and teachers were all able to hear his story. The um, Colonial Academy is working towards starting a chapter of Stand for the Silent and hopes to be recognized um, this spring. And to request a presentation by Kirk Smalley, um, you can contact Stand for the Silent Foundation at contact at standforthesilent.org. And really, the platform is to offer educational tools that will help prevent the tragedy that happened to them to happen to another child and family. Also, Act 20, I'm sorry, Act 71 training is offered at the IU 20. Um, and they're currently offering an online learning path um, for understanding youth suicide and prevention. And if uh, interested, just visit the IU website and so the www.ciu20.org slash Act 71. And um, also, um, the high school programming competition was held at IU 20. And um, there was a challenge um, for students from Colonial and uh, Carbon High Intermediate Units in a computer programming contest <coughs> called Programming Challenge 1.0. The competition highlighted high school students' problem solving and programming skills. And the event was a collaboration between IU 20, 21, and Yale University. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the um, okay. Also, um, talking about uh, early intervention, that that the East Stroudsburg area um, partnered with Monroe County Head Start and the IU 20 to improve quality early literacy instruction. For the past three years, staff have been working collaboratively to improve literacy um, in their classrooms as part of the Keystone Opportunity Plan. And um, what's interesting <coughs> is that as East Stroudsburg educators look at the um, DIBLES, uh next longitudinal data, they notice significantly higher percentage of Head Start students benchmarked on the district screeners and other kindergartners and first grade students. So this seems to confirm um, the research that stated that early intervention is close to instructional, helps close instructional black gaps of children and makes a difference in their lives. So that's what's going on at IU 20. Thank you very much. You want to do the uh, library? Okay, library. All right. All right. Um, well, um, over the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, um, new carpeting was installed in the Marks room, and everything was moved out except for the East Blue flag. And so a special thanks to the Friends of the Library and the, the request from the Marks room by Jane Moore to make the po project possible. So it's good to have new carpeting in that room. Um, there also will be um, is community outreach um, from police and hospitals for special programs for engage for help that will be held in the library in April and more information will be following. And also due to popular demand, Let's Color Art class um, is held on Mondays and Wednesdays in the Youth Services Department and there will be two different groups and local artists will help teach our classes. There. So that's what's going on in Harbor. Thank you very much. Nice. CIT. This has Mr. Vandenberg and his wife. Thank you. Community College, Mr. Fable. I think everybody received in their packets uh, the letter, the lowdown, which talked about our students at the community college. As well as we really didn't have a meeting this past month. Thank you. Letter F, Charles Ren Science and Technology Initiative, Mr. Monahan. Legislative, Mr. Fable. Well, I think everybody's heard that, you know, the new 2016-2017 budget's been out there uh, <laughs> indicating increases for our school year, so uh, now let's wait and see what happens. Do we have uh, Ms. Lutz, the High School Student Council Executive Board President here? Yes, Mr. Cuck is actually oh, out. That's okay. He just wanted me to relay that he's out to district 
girls varsity basketball game. They're playing in the semifinals tonight against Pottsville at Allen. I'm not sure if we got the update from Mr. Case's wife yet, but anyway, we're hoping that it's a success. So, Sarah, go ahead and give me a report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our report is pretty much the same as last month, but I'll just reiterate some of the dates that are coming up. Um, our Special Olympics Gymnastics in the high school gym will be held on March 2nd. We have our Mr. Yeah. Easton competition April 14th at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. We're lucky to have Mr. Reinhardt as one of our judges. <laughs> we have our Special Olympics Track and Field held at Liberty High School on May 5th. Our prom will be May 28th at Steel Stacks, and then graduation is June 13th. That's about all I have. Thank you. Thank you. PTA. Hello, I'm Glenn Alexander. I'm from the uh, Eastern Area Middle School 5-6 PTA, but also Area Council. I'm here for Michelle, who's unfortunately sick tonight, Michelle Robertson. I'm um, doing the PTA report. Um, we have a lot of good things going on. Um, Cheston is kicking off a groovy scholastic book fair on February 29th with a staff dress-up contest. The staff will dress up groovy for the day and students will vote. And the top three staff members will get a prize. The book fair will conclude with the family and math reading night on March 3rd. Um, the middle school, 5-6. Um, um, we wanted to thank everyone who came out to the Panera fundraiser. Um, it was you know, it was nice to see a lot of familiar faces and board members and, and staff. Um, we also wanted to let you know that we've been raising money and organizing something called the Rover Boutique. Some of you might not know what that is, but it's, it's a confidential resource at the middle school for families that might need clothing, personal supplies, products. Um, it's a confidential resource for them to go in and shop for what they need. Um, so that's going on there. A new report that we have is from the Easton Area Academy. Um, they recently started an anonymous food pantry stocked by staff and identified students are provided food and personal hygiene products when needed. Um, several of their high school <laughs> students recently took a tour of Crayola's manufacturing facilities and others will soon visit. Um, will soon visit Olympus. Sorry. Um, the guidance department is currently in the process of organizing a college fair for the students and collecting donations in an effort to make the event a success for students and their families. So we're glad to have a report from them this month. Um, at March, there was a membership drive that was done this month to recruit more members, and they had a spirit wear sale featuring Easton items. Um, the Palmer Elementary is hosting PTA Founders Day, and as the board members know, you are all invited. It's on March 1st. Um, and hopefully you can RSVP to the um, organizers there, and we hope that all of you can, can fit that in your busy schedule. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of good stuff going on like this. They're doing a Panther Boutique there, which is you know yet another resource for the community, and I think it's something to be proud of. The Panther Boutique is... Um, is an effort to take a room in the building and make sort of a store where parents are collecting donations, clothing, things for people in need in the community um, so that people can go in and go shopping. So there's sort of a trend here, which I think we're all kind of happy to see, of students and staff <coughs> stepping forward and trying to think of ways to, you know, um, help the community. At Tracy, they're, um, Tracy Elementary, they're hosting Lehigh Valley Hospital Safety Town on March 3rd. It's a pop-up town that students go through to learn the dangers of rooms within the home. On March 15th, Tracy will host an open Q&A discussion regarding the district's leveling up detracking initiative, and the discussion will be held in the Tracy cafeteria. Um, I saved Forks Elementary for last because, as you could see from that presentation, the loss was significant to materials, to resources, um, to the classrooms. Um, but as usual, in the Easton community, it was an opportunity for people to step up, to help out, to donate. So we do have a letter from the president of the Forks PTA on that to, to finish out the report. Um, and that's from Kimberly Van Pell from the Forks PTA. The show of support for Forks Elementary has been amazing. The way our school district community has come together to support our teachers has been touching. Parents in the community dropped off teacher supplies at home in the district. These supplies were then given to our teachers. Our PTA created, created an online sign up for parents to contribute toward everyday supplies used by our students. Within two hours, these supplies were all filled. Um, 
the list was filled, sorry. Parents and community members donated gift cards to go towards supplies teachers had purchased with their own money. Parents and community members randomly dropped off books and other supplies. Principals and teachers from other schools shared curriculum resources to accommodate the books that were damaged. And food was donated by a teacher at the middle school, as well as Chick-fil-A, Giant, Easton Foundation, Chartwells, and other parents. Cards were sent to us by schools, even in other places in the district, to cheer up students and staff. And the show of support is also coming from individuals outside of the district. Farmersville Elementary School donated cards. Powhat Common School District in New Jersey took up a collection for our teachers. Even a gentleman from Levittown, PA, sent a monetary donation toward our teachers as well. This week, once again, proves <coughs> that Eastern Area School District, its community, and those touched by our community exhibit a philosophy championed by our school district superintendent, Mr. Reinhardt, for the good of each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, EAEA? Good evening. Richard Ressler, uh, the elementary vice president. Um, short and sweet. Um, first, the union would like to uh, thank Ms. Mealy and uh, Ms. Uh, Piazza um, for reaching out to the teachers. Um, as you well know, we are um, making some major changes at the K through 5 level. Um, next year with the integration of fifth grade back to the elementary schools. Um, and both have reached out and have included us in the process as to where teachers might possibly end up, and, and we really do appreciate that. Um, so thank you to both of you, as to Mr. Reinhardt as well, and members of the board for making this possible. Um, we would also like to just say we are uh, looking forward to tomorrow evening uh, as we sit down to begin negotiations on our next collective bargaining agreement, and we, uh, we are eagerly Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone here from the bus driver? Good evening. I'm Deb Watchler, your assistant shop, shop steward. Uh, Helen Jones is sick tonight, so I'm here for her. Um, we just wanted to give you an update there. There have been 17 cameras installed in the buses, and the balance of them should be installed by the end of next week. Also, the transportation department collected money for the um, teachers at the... At the um, Forks Elementary School, and we collected five hundred thirty dollars <coughs> and have delivered that to the teachers. Thank you. EASD Diversity Committee. Uh, yes, our next meeting is uh, March twenty third. I'm looking forward to that. And as I mentioned to the board, we will be having a full report and uh, a a draft of our plan coming up very shortly. And, Mr. President, if you don't mind, I'd just like to react, if I could, to the uh, support from the bus drivers. Um, I, I want to um, acknowledge the fact that our bus drivers have been stepping up um, in this district for many reasons over the past couple years. And uh, I want to publicly uh, thank you and please give my thanks to everyone in return. Uh, because they have become uh, a very, very generous and an important part of our, our support system here in the district, uh, along with our teachers and our support staff and others. So our administrative team, as you recall, they all helped with the food prog uh, program this summer. It's just tremendous uh, to see that people fill in and help out uh, at times when we need to have their support. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to number six. Is there anyone from the public who would like to be heard on agenda items only? Well, my name is um, John Kennedy. I um, live in 7, 718 Capel Street, and uh, I saw Mr. Vandenberg on the street the other day. I told him I was going to come to a meeting. So there I am. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I'm not, well, this is stuff that's been mentioned, so I assume that it qualifies as an agenda item. If it's on the agenda. The, the, the reports are those part of the agenda. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, 
First, uh, I'd like to uh, say how grateful I am to the board uh, for installing those bus cameras. I think it's really an important, uh, important initiative, and I'm glad that it's almost done. Um, I hope it'll be done within the next month, I guess. Um, I'd also like to congratulate the board on the continuing effort to meet the physical needs of all the students in the district. Uh, a lot of that you've done, uh, and I congratulate the superintendent also, a lot of that you've done simply by cooperating with a lot of the groups in the district who are willing to provide things like coats and back, backpack lunches and things like that, as well as your own efforts to create neighborhood schools. Um, I think that's, that's such an outstanding and important effort on your part. You've got some really good publicity on the, um, uh, uh, I think it was Bill White's uh, column, in terms of the efforts that uh, some people have put into computer science at the high school. And in fact, uh, 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 you have, uh, I guess, uh, over 200 students uh, who are actually in computer science classes at the high school. And again, part of this is accomplished by having some really good people there and also uh, allowing them to go ahead and do that kind of work. But 200 students represents 10% of that school's population. I guess you know what I'm going to say next, is that uh, I haven't seen uh, much movement in the, in the area of computer coding for all. You may have noticed that the President of the United States is now uh, supporting this initiative wholeheartedly. Uh, and you may say to yourself, now I, I, I would say that the, you have a model in the school system south, south of your Palisade school system. And you may say to yourself, well, they're nothing like we are. But consider this. The school systems where you have, and by the way, the, the, the 200 students puts you probably in the upper 10% of Pennsylvania schools. But the schools that have the computer science for all students are attempting to have that are the ones in what I would call the outer suburban ring. Like uh, Palisades is, is actually the outer <coughs> suburban ring of Philadelphia and New York. And you say, well, we're nothing like them. But consider this, you are part of the outer suburban ring of New York City and Philadelphia. Now you have a wide variety of elements in your school system, but the parents in the outer suburban ring are going to demand certain types of education. If they don't get them in the school system, they go elsewhere. But what's interesting to me about this, and why I always tried to follow when I was dealing with uh, setting up computer science programs. I always tried to follow those schools that were in the outer suburban ring because what they want for their students is the same thing that all parents want. They're just not able to get it sometimes. But what I'm suggesting is that you start on the path and, and, and work towards that sort of goal. And I would just, you know, the simplest way is to call it a computer coding for all. It's really computer science for all. And first thing people say to me when I suggest this is it's all about money. Well, no, it's not all about money. You actually have the people to do this and you have the facilities to do this. And you have the equipment. The question is, will it become a goal? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public who would like to be heard on agenda items only? Can I speak now on detracting? Uh, no, that would be at the end. The end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the minutes as posted? Second. All those in favor? Aye. <coughs> Oppos opposed. I'd like to take. Number 8A, 
number nine, A through M. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'd like to take number 10, A, C, D, E, F, G, H. I'm taking out B separately. H, is that right there? I and 11, finance, A through H. Can I have a motion with the exception of 10 B? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. What I'd like to do before we end this meeting is adjourn for a short executive session and then come back and continue. Thank you. We're going to have a short executive session.
Um, for the record, the meeting of the executive session was for a discipline, uh, student discipline discussion. We're going to go back to academics number 10, letter B, expulsion hearing waiver. Can I have a motion? 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 Can I have a Rob Obey is going to abstain. Uh, can I have a motion to accept? Motion. Can I have a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I'm going to know we have two abstentions. Yeah. Do you have five? Yeah. Yeah, one, two. Yeah, you got five. All right, moving on. Is there anyone here, number 13, from the public who would like to be heard on non-agenda items only? Non-agenda items only, ma'am? Yes. Just talk a little bit, make some comments about the detracking initiative. Mm -hmm. Where's just right there? Uh, how chill? There's no doubt that there are positives to detracking if implemented correctly. I heard Mr. Beecher state at the February 9th committee meeting that Abington High School and Southside Middle School had great success with detracking, as outlined in the book, Excellence <coughs> Through Equity, that our district is using as a training tool to detract. However, Mr. Beecher also stated that the tracking at the middle school has been fast-tracked and it is of concern that the tracking in Easton will not include smaller class sizes or necessary support for teachers. She mentioned that the district is focusing on chapters 3 and 11 in the book. I read those two chapters and it seems that the administrators moving this initiative forward have skipped over some very important steps. I would like to read a few short quotes from Chapter 3 written by Dr. Carol Corbett Burris, Principal of Southside High School, in one of the districts that saw great success. On page 61, the detracting de of the Southside Middle School is discussed. She writes, in five years' time, the tracks in all subjects, with the exception of math and science, have been eliminated. <laughs> so it took five years to successfully detract the middle school grades 6 through 8. On page 69, she writes, Prior to the abolishment of tracking, we engaged in a period allowing students to choose their track rather than be assigned one. As more classes chose the upper track, the class became more heterogeneous, allowing teachers to adjust their methodology. By the time we moved to heterogeneous grouping, our teachers were ready. On page 70, she writes, the process of detracking was gradual and thoughtful. For example, only after English 11 for all students in detract classes had a two-year success record, did we detract grade 12. And on page 71, she writes, teachers need strategies to challenge high achievers and strategies to support lower achievers. It is the obligation of school leaders to provide professional development and support to make this happen. It is also the obligation of the district to make sure that schools have the resources to provide support. Currently, there has been very little professional development for teachers in the Eastern District with few in-service days left on the school calendar. And we have heard the concern of not only the teachers, but the administration that class sizes will not decrease and necessary supports will not be added. Here's the last quote I would like to read from Chapter 3. One of the first steps in closing the achievement gap is the dismantling of tracking. It cannot, however, happen in a vacuum. It is a reform <coughs> worth doing, but like all reforms, it must be done well. The book the district is using as a guide clearly defines the, so, the slow process the two districts that successfully detract went through. One school district detract one grade at a time, and the other district detract one subject throughout the school at a time. Abington School District used committees to plan for the detracking made up of administration, teachers, parents, and students, and put supports in place prior to detracking. Both districts used the process of volunteer enrollment for one year prior to detracking, so any child who wanted to enroll on a higher track could do so. Why not start the 2016 year with volunteer enrollment at the middle school, having the students choose the level class in which they feel comfortable, 
allowing for a more gradual transition and acclimation for students and teachers, and also <coughs> allowing another year for professional development of teachers while strategically planning for necessary resources to bring class sizes down and add supports when needed. Then in 2017, to track either all of the sixth grade or one subject in sixth grade through eighth grade. Continually monitor and reassess what is working and fix what isn't working, and year after year, add another subject or grade level, but with the necessary resources in place. Board members, in your honest opinion, is the current plan for detracking the best the district can possibly do? Superintendent Reinhardt stated he felt morally obligated to abolish the tracking system, but aren't we also more morally and ethically obligated to make sure we are responsibly and thoughtfully implementing a drastic change to our secondary education system that will impact the futures of thousands of children? Don't we want to ensure the best possible outcomes for all students? I am urging the school board members and administration to slow this initiative down and move forward in a thoughtful, responsible manner when implementing detracting in the district. We only have one chance to get this right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to be heard on non-agenda items only? Sign in and state your name and where you're from. Good evening. My name is Amanda Williams, and I live at 1131 Spring Garden Street in the West Ward. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here this evening. And I wanted to start out by saying <coughs> I am a huge, huge fan of open space. And I feel that that is one area that every human being needs access to, and we're severely lacking that in the West Ward. Uh, I grew up in Williams Township, but when my husband and I got married, we chose to make the West Ward our home, and we've been there for the past 13 years. Uh, we've added three children along the way, and we purchased our property uh, because we have a very large yard, and our children enjoy that very much. Um, what I'm concerned about this evening, and the reason why I'm here is, with your upcoming parking lot proposal in the Paxitanosa renovations project, you're suggesting that you add an additional 80 space parking lot in an area where we are already overrun by blacktop paved surfaces. Your Paxitanosa Elementary School is the heart of the West Ward, it truly is. Without the resources of the property of Paxinosa and the Cottingham Stadium and the park behind it. The West Ward truly has no <coughs> large meeting space left. That's it. That's all we've got. Um, so I think it's very important um, that you would take uh, another look at this. I know that we're getting close to the wire here. I know that it's coming up to the City Planning Committee, and I know that they're going to vote on that shortly. But I'm just urging you to re-examine that. I've spoken to several key community people, several leaders, I've spoken to residents, I've spoken to current teachers at Paxinosa, prior teachers at Paxinosa, and everyone that I speak to, not a single one rates that parking lot as a necessity. Convenience, absolutely. Possible resource, maybe, but not as a necessity. So I just would encourage you maybe to, to look at that and, and also to focus on the big picture of the Paxinosa campus itself, and now that we are aware of the fact that the school district also owns <coughs> the basketball courts and the parking lot behind the Cottingham Stadium in addition to the stadium, what is the big picture of that? If you're taking away the grass area to be consumed by a parking lot, are you trading that out for more green space somewhere else for us, perhaps eliminating that Cottingham parking lot or something else where the community can come together and use that as a resource, not only just the children that are there during the school day, but also the rest of us on nights and weekends. I've started to look at things like how full is that 80 space parking lot behind Cottingham Stadium during the day, and the truth of the matter is it's not. So I know that you're adding additional staff, but you still have quite a few parking spaces available that I don't know that we need 80 more spaces. Um, I know that the teacher safety was the biggest concern that I heard, that teachers didn't feel safe crossing, leaving Patsonosa, crossing 12th Street, and walking past the basketball courts to then 
get to the parking lot where their car is. I can, I can understand that to a certain extent. I was an elementary school teacher prior to being a stay-at-home mom. I, I know what all of that's about. I know the area well. I live there. But I, I just really don't feel, as well as many people that I've spoken to, that it's a necessity to remove that beautiful green space and create yet another paved surface. So I was just hoping that we could get a big picture of what will be coming down the pike instead of just piecemeal, well, we have this money, so let's pay the parking lot. What's next? Let, let's get a big sense of what's coming. Well, man, what, I, what I would just basically quickly say is security for our teachers was pretty much the main concern. <coughs> the teachers have been advocating for the parking to come over there for their safety for years. Um, longer than I've been on the board, I'm one of my fifth year. So it is a safety concern. It's the reason why we're doing it. Secondly, you kept mentioning us taking away green space. I just want to make sure you're aware we currently have three quarters of an acre of green space there. Mm -hmm. When this project is done, we're going to have three quarters of an acre of green space. So we're not taking any green space away. Um, actually, it's going to be open more because the modulars will be gone. So instead of it going this way and this way, it's going to be more open. So we're not taking any green space away. The green space that you talk about now is going to be the same amount of green space that we're going to have when the project is done. So you're not losing it. I do understand that, but on the same token, we're not gaining any, if you understand where I'm coming from. Because, and I, I do understand that that is, is school property, but it has been in the talks in the past that the community would have access to that open green space. You know, I guess I'm, the community really never had access to it. Correct. Right. Not only are we not lessening the green space, but you're going to have all the access to it now. Okay. So you are you're going to access it, which you could have never done before, okay. and we're not losing it. Okay. So it's you know there's not going to be a building there in the middle. Uh, it's going to be open for the community. We've talked to uh, Mike from Mike uh, Hallerbach, mm -hmm. and he's looking at putting uh, field mm -hmm. hockey or something in there. I mean these are things that were kicked around. So not only are we not reducing any green space, we're actually going to now make it available to the public, which you didn't have access to before. Um, so it's, you know, I think we're doing a great day for the West Ward. Um, we're keeping the green space and we're now we're making this accessible to the residents of the West Ward. <coughs> May I just ask you, what necessitates 80 additional parking spaces if the current 80 are not consumed? I understand that we're... Right. Well, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're looking to take parking away from Northampton Street. Um, it's a safety issue. It, it, it basically, it's, it's a safety issue. It boils down to safety, um, and, and our teachers feel more secure, more safe parking behind the building as opposed to going across the street or crossing Northampton Street, and it's something that they've been asking for years, and it's something that the board has agreed to give, um, and again, we're not taking anything from the community. We're actually adding by allowing the public to have it, so, you know, it's a juggling act. We're not going to make everybody happy all the time, but we're trying to please as many as we can, and... I think we are pleasing the West Ward by keeping what we have and making it open to them. And we're also pleasing our staff to where they're now going to feel more secure and safe. And, you know, as a, as a public school, it's a juggling act. And we're trying to make everybody as happy as possible. Okay. Um, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Have you. a good day. Anyone else on uh, non-agenda items only? Yes. Be happy to know it's also about the Paxanosa green space um, in support of, of the same idea. Um, we we also attended the presentation a few months back on the um, the renovation plans. Um, uh, one of the things that keeps coming up about it being a community school, um, there's offices, there's clinics, there's things going in there, but as we keep saying, what we don't have in West Ward is green space. So maybe, and I hear what you're saying and, and the way that you answered her question, and I appreciate that. I guess we're wondering if there is a way to then do anything with the property that the teachers don't want to use. So, you know, our understanding is that property behind Cottingham where the teachers don't want to use for parking because of safety and the reasons that you mentioned, um, is is there maybe a way to talk about using that space somehow as, as a way for the community? Because what, what I'll say is there are discussions there. Okay. Um, it's not something that we're looking to jump on right away because you know, you're talking about a lot of money. A lot of money that the district doesn't have, the taxpayers nor the community really have. So it is being discussed, and maybe down the road something will be there. However, our, prim our priority right now is the school, 
and the building and putting the clinic and doing what we can for the community. Um, we haven't forgot about that, but that will be down the road before we can look at anything like that. As far as a fun, and a, from a funding point of view, you know, we've, we've been coming to understand what the community school model means as far as bringing in services and things. Is there a contribution to any of those projects on the part of, for, for example, maybe United Way or any of those entities that are coming in to serve our students and our community, you know, these neighborhoods? Is there, as far as the construction going on, is there a way that they could even be a partner in converting some of those spaces, maybe well, so that it isn't only a responsibility right. of the district? Well, we're still working on some things that we'll discuss in, in March, um, working on with the city, and you know, we'll have more information. Myself and the mayor are, are, are going to bring some things to the board. So we'll have some more information on that. I can tell you the clinic we're talking about, all we're doing is providing the space. The clinic would have to pay and put everything and do all the work. We're not we're not putting any of that bill. So to answer your question, we are doing that. Um, you know, we're, we're, we just can't afford. If it was up to us, we wouldn't have a clinic. So you know what I mean. We're going to give the space, and, and the clinic uh, uh, would be responsible for the construction fee costs and this and that. So um, you know, we are looking at that. We are doing that. So. I mean, I I guess just to put it out there, there are a lot of us that have, so, you know, concerns about the fact that, you know, from an athletic point of view, from a health point of view, you know, it is very difficult for our students to live in an environment where, you know, it came up, um, my daughter plays field hockey with, with some of the kids, and, you know, some of the kids were talking, well, where do you practice? There's nowhere to, to play sports by us. You know, you have to get in the car and drive. We drive to Forks to do those activities, but that's not walking distance. So, I, you know, just something to put out there to think of as you do, you know, bigger planning, that if there's a way to maybe compromise and do something with that other plot, that, you know, we, we, we'd be pretty happy with that. Yeah, I mean, it, is, it, it hasn't been uh, disregarded. It's just, you know, we got to focus on the priority, which is the building first. And then, so it hasn't been uh, overlooked or disregarded. Um, you know, it's just we have to go with priority, and unfortunately, you know, money is, 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 is tight, you know, these days, and, and raising the taxes are hardly the answer, you know. Um, so, but we are we are thinking about it. We haven't forgotten it, and, um, you know, we also have met with people in West Ward, and, you know, you've been involved, and, and the mayor and everybody else, so we're trying to do the best we can for the West Ward. And like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. You know, you want to give, you don't want to take, but it, it's just... You have to put priorities in order and do the best you can. We do, and we do appreciate and understand that. I know there's work needed at Palmer. There's a lot of there are a lot of needs. We we do get that, but you know that's why we come to let you know you know what we're talking about. So absolutely, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public on non-agenda items only? Seeing none. Any other business from the board? Yes. Thank you. I just have a couple of recognition things. Um, some. Emails we received one from Carolyn Serva for Lafayette College involved with the Athletes Care 2016 All or Nothing campaign. You can go on and vote. Um, East and Bethlehem are receiving some of the funds, and what they if they win and they, uh, the money they've raised um, will be going towards the um, Backpack House. So the website is athletes.care, and you can vote until Thursday. Um, we also received from Paul Dorney the East Area Middle School Dream It. Do it. What's um, what's cool about manufacturing? And I wanted to encourage everybody to check this website out too. Uh, it's um, dreamitdoitpa.com, and it's really interesting because all the kids in eighth grade in the area school districts have gone to different manufacturings, and I didn't realize some of the actual manufacturing plants that are around. So it's really interesting, and I encourage you to check it out. Um, and the other one was the Skills USA, the district competition results that we received from Mr. Reinhardt. And I'd just like to recognize some of the students that did place. Uh, Kylie Joe, Ascani, Hunter Austin, Ryan Todd, Brooke Strausser, Daniel Hallman, Kate Ruggiero, Javier Chavez, Jordan Beischer, Robert DeSano, and Brianna McNally. And we have two students, uh, Brooke Strausser and Javier Chavez, that will be going to the um, state competition. So good luck to them. And Ms. Hess, just as an FYI, we have certificates for those students, so we'll recognize them next month. Yes. Anyone else? Hearing that, can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Second.
One more piece of good news for the board. We have a two minute executive session in conclusion. Please sign on the grass later. All those in favor? All those in favor?